Zora and Me, Chapter 6. It was getting on dinner and we walked Teddy as far as his path before heading to the Hurston home, where I ate on Monday, Thursday, and Friday evenings. Zora had only to hit the first step on the porch of their eight-room house for her mama to know it was her. She often said that, of all of her children, Zora's footsteps sounded most like her own. Not many folks pay close attention to what their own footsteps sounds like, but Lucy Hurston did. That Kira you got with you, she called, better be. Yes, mama. Zora answered, opening the front door. We just been at the Love and Pine. I used to eat at home with my mama and daddy every night, just the three of us, except for when my daddy was working out of town. As far back as I can remember, my mama was always out of the house by the time I woke up, gone to work in the laundry at the big park house hotel in, Mat in Lake Matlin. A month after my daddy left for Orlando, she picked up a second shift three nights a week. Used to be I had breakfast with my daddy, lunch at school, and supper with my mama and daddy both. But with him gone and her working so much, it was awfully lonely eating. I guess Zora told her mama about it, because the next thing I knew, there was Mrs. Hurston visiting my mama, asking if she could spare me the night she worked late, on account of Mrs. Hurston had so much housework, but with a new baby, and she could really use an extra set of hands. As we walked into the kitchen, we saw Billy Bronson standing by the sink with Mrs. Hurston. Billy was maybe only twice our age, but she seemed very grown to me, not old so much as Ernest. I suppose doing something as important as delivering babies made her very serious about life. Hello, Miss Billy, Zora and I said in unison. Hey, you two, she said. She had a soft voice, not crackly like old Lady Bronson's. Her hands were deep in her apron pockets, but her fingers couldn't keep still. Billy gave Mrs. Hurston a worried glance. Billy said, when I left my granny after lunch, she was going to fish some supper and look for some eucalyptus to boil with lavender to help soft up Mrs. Calhoun's back some. Y'all know Mrs. Calhoun's expecting a baby next month? We nodded, though it was still hard for us to imagine our teacher having a life outside of school. Well, my granny should have been home hours ago, and I've been looking everywhere. I had never heard that old lady Bronson referred to as anyone's grandma before, and the title coupled with the affection in Miss Billy's voice startled me. Realizing that Miss Billy loved old lady Bronson was made the woman more human to me, even vulnerable. Mrs. Hurston put a reassuring hand on Billy's shoulder and asked us, Y'all seen old lady Bronson around today? We seen her. Our heads were nodding like leaves in a storm. We seen her. Miss Billy's eyes jumped. Where? Where did you see her? Over by Blue Sink, fishing, Zora said. We were going to go swimming, but she shooed us away. How long ago? The time between school letting out and us coming in to help make dinner always seemed to us like most of our waking hours, even though it couldn't have been more than three or four at the most. Um, two hours? It was as good a guess as any. The crease in Miss Billy's brow came back as she started for the door. Zora grabbed my hand and we headed out after Miss Billy. Mama, Zora called, we'll walk with Miss Billy to the blue sink and come right back. We caught up with Miss Billy and fast walked in silence. I couldn't stop thinking about Mr. Pender with a gator head instead of his own. Right before we turned off the road, we saw Mr. Calhoun striding toward us on his way home from the schoolhouse. Mr. Calhoun, Miss Billy called, can you help us look for my grandma? Zora sprinted up to Mr. Calhoun. Old Lady Bronson was late coming home after getting her, your wife herself. She blurted out to catch him up. Mr. Calhoun didn't ask any questions, just fell into a quick pace beside us. There was an eerie stillness at the pond. Granny, Miss Billy called out. Granny, you here? Her call was met with silence. Mr. Calhoun wiped his forehead with a handkerchief and walked around the rest, west side of the sink. Zora cocked her head like a forest animal listening for breaking twigs then darted off to the red cliff below where we'd spied the old lady after school. I followed close behind. Miss Billy, Mr. Calhoun, she's here, I called. Miss Billy and Mr. Calhoun sprinted over to us just below us and below the ledge. Sprawled on the rocks was old lady Bronson. A deep purple bruise ringed her right eye and she moaned softly. Her eyes were closed. Her fishing rod was floating in the shallow water beside her. I couldn't imagine how she fell from the perch where we'd left her fishing. Then, Miss Billy climbed down the cliff to the rocks and gently cradled her grandmother's head in her lap. Oh, Granny, she whispered, you okay? Old Lady Bronson opened her eyes for just a second and laughed weaky. You ain't rid of me yet, Billy Marie Bronson. And with that, she fell faint again. Mr. Calhoun picked Old Lady Bronson up in his strong and steady arms and carried her up out of the sink. Thin and small as she seemed with her eyes closed, the old lady still had a formidable presence. Mr. Calhoun smiled at us. Don't you girls worry. I think she's going to be okay. Then he and Billy headed off to old lady Bronson's house. 
Just as they disappeared from the clearing into the trees, we heard a tiny noise that made us both look up. In the twilight, we could see the outline of Mr. Pender's little house. In the doorway, against the light from inside, we saw the unmistakable, unmistakable silhouette of Mr. Pender leaning against the jam. His head was as human as mine, but the sight of him watching us sparked my imagination something powerful. Suddenly, Zora's story didn't seem so far-fetched at all. Suddenly, I believed that he might change shape right there in front of us. I heard a booming beat and then realized it was coming from inside me, as if someone had replaced my eardrums with kettle drums. Zora took my hand. We backed slowly to the tree line, then tore off running to her house.